The Sane Society by Eric Fromm. This is part two of chapter five. Chapter five is called Man in Capitalistic Society. <clears throat> B. Alienation. The foregoing discussion of the process of abstractification leads to the central issue of the effects of capitalism on personality, the phenomenon of alienation. By alienation is meant a mode of experience in which the person experiences himself as an alien. He has become, one might say, estranged from himself. He does not experience himself as the center of his world, as the creator of his own acts, but his acts and their consequences have become his masters, whom he obeys, or whom he may even worship. The alienated person is out of touch with himself as he is out of touch with any other person. He, like the others, are experienced as things are experienced, with the senses and with common sense, but at the same time without being related to oneself and to the world outside, produ uh, outside productively. The older meaning in which alienation was used was to denote an insane person. Aliene in French, alienado in Spanish are older words for the psychotic the thoroughly and absolutely alienated person. Alienist in English is still used for the doctor who cares for the insane. In the last century, the word alienation was used by Hegel and Marx, referring not to a state of insanity, but to a less drastic form of self-estrangement, which permits the person to act reasonably in practical matters, yet which constitutes one of the most severe socially patterned defects. In Marx's system, alienation is called that condition of man where his own act becomes to him an alien power, standing over and against him instead of being ruled by him. But while the use of the word alienation in this general sense is a recent one, the concept is a much older one. It is the same to which the prophets of the Old Testament referred as idolatry. It will help us to a better understanding of alienation if we begin by considering the meaning of idolatry. The prophets of monotheism did not denounce heathen religions as idolatrous, primarily because they worshipped several gods instead of one. The essential difference between monotheism and polytheism is not one of the number of gods, but lies in the fact of self-alienation. Man spends his energy, his artistic capacities on building an idol, and then he worships this idol, which is nothing but the result of his own human effort. His life forces have flown into a thing, and this thing, having become an idol, is not experienced as a result of his own productive effort, but as something apart from himself, over and against him, which he worships and to which he submits. As the prophet Hosea says, A sewer shall not save us, we will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods. For in thee the fatherless finds love. Idolatrous man bows down to the work of his own hands. The idol represents his own life forces in an alienated form. The principle of monotheism, in contrast, is that man is infinite, that there is no partial quality in him which can be hypostasized into the whole. God, in the, monothe in the monotheistic concept, is unrecognizable and undefinable. God is not a thing. If man is created in the likeness of God, he is created as the bearer of infinite qualities. In idolatry, man bows down and submits to the projection of one partial quality in himself. He does not experience himself as the center from which living acts of love and reason radiate. He becomes a thing. His neighbor becomes a thing, just as his gods are things. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold. The work of men's hands, they have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like them. So is everyone that trusts in them. Um, that was a quotation from Psalm, or Psalm 135. I don't know how you like quote the Bible properly. Monotheistic religions themselves have, to a large extent, regressed into idolatry. Man projects his power of love and of reason unto God. 
He does not feel them any more as his own powers. And then he prays to God to give him back some of what he, man, has projected onto God. In early Protestantism and Calvinism, the required religious attitude is that man should feel himself empty and impoverished and put his trust in the grace of God, that is, into the hope that God may return to him part of his own qualities, which he has put into God. Every act of submissive worship is an act of alienation and idolatry in this sense. What is frequently called love is often nothing but this idolatrous phenomenon of alienation, only that not God or an idol, but another person is worshipped in this way. The loving person in this type of submissive relationship projects all his or her love, strength, thought into the other person, and experiences the loved person as as a superior being, finding satisfaction in complete submission and worship. This does not only mean that he fails to experience the loved person as a human being in his or her reality, but that he does not experience himself in his full reality as the bearer of productive human powers. Just as in the case of religious idolatry, he has projected all his richness into the other person and experiences this rich- richness not anymore as something which is his, but as something alien from himself deposited in somebody else <clears throat> with which he can get in touch only by submission to or submergence in the other person. The same phenomenon exists in the worshipping submission to a political leader or to the state. The leader and the state actually are what they are by the consent of the governed, but they become idols when the individual projects all his powers into them and worships them, hoping to regain some of his powers by submission and worship. In Rousseau's theory of the state, as in contemporary totalitarianism, the individual is supposed to abdicate his own rights and to project them unto the state as the only arbiter. In fascism and Stalinism, the absolutely alienated individual worships at the altar of an idol, and it makes little difference by what names this idol is known, state, class, collective, or what else. We can speak of idolatry or alienation not only in relationship to other people, but also in relationship to oneself, when the person is subject to irrational passions. The person who is mainly motivated by his lust for power does not experience himself any more in the richness and limitlessness of a human being, but he becomes a slave to one partial striving in him, which is projected into external aims by which he is possessed. The person who is given to the exclusive pursuit of his passion for money is possessed by his striving for it. Money is the idol which he worships as the projection of one isolated power in himself, his greed for it. In this sense, the neurotic person is an alienated person. His actions are not his own. While he is under the illusion of doing what he wants, he is driven by forces which are separated from his self, which work behind his back. He is a stranger to himself, just as his fellow man is a stranger to him. He experiences the other in himself not as what they really are, but distorted by the unconscious forces which operate in them. The insane person is the absolutely alienated person. He has completely lost himself as the center of his own experience. He has lost the sense of self. What is common to all these phenomena, the worship of idols, the idolatrous worship of God, the idolatrous love for a person, the worship of a political leader or the state, and the idolatrous worship of the externalizations of irrational passions is the process of alienation. It is the fact that man does not experience himself as the active bearer of his own powers and richness, but as an impoverished thing, dependent on powers outside of himself, unto whom he has projected his living substance. As the reference to idolatry indicates, alienation is by no means a modern, a modern phenomenon. It would go far beyond the scope of this book to attempt a sketch on the history of alienation. Suffice it to say that it seems alienation differs from culture to culture, both in the specific spheres which are alienated and in the thoroughness and completeness of the process. Alienation as we find it in modern society is almost total. It pervades the relationship of man to his work, to the things he consumes, to the state, to his fellow man, and to himself. 
Man has created a world of man-made things as it never existed before. He has constructed a complicated social machine to administer the technical machine he built. Yet this whole creation of his stands over and above him. He does not feel himself as a creator and center, but as the servant of a golem, which his hands have built. The more powerful and gigantic the forces are which he unleashes, the more powerless he feels himself as a human being. He confronts himself with his own forces embodied in things he has created, alienated from himself. He is owned by his own creation and has lost ownership of himself. He has built a golden calf and says, these are your gods who have brought you out of Egypt. What happens to the worker? To put it in the words of a thoughtful and thorough observer of the industrial scene. In industry, the person becomes an economic atom that dances to the tune of atomistic management. Your place is just here. You will sit in this fashion. Your arms will move X inches in a course of Y radius and the time of movement will be 0.000 minutes. Work is becoming more repetitive and thoughtless as the planners, the micro micro motionists and the scientific managers further strip the worker of his right to think and move freely. Life is being denied. Need to control, creativeness, curiosity and independent thought are being balked and the result The inevitable result is flight or fight on the part of the worker, apathy or destructiveness, psychic regression. The role of the manager is also one of alienation. It is true he manages the whole and not a part, but he too is alienated from his product as something concrete and useful. His aim is to employ profitably the capital invested by others, although in comparison with the older type of owner-manager, Modern management is much less interested in the amount of profit to be paid out as dividend to the stockholder than it is in the efficient operation and expansion of the enterprise. Characteristically, within management, those in charge of labor relations and of sales, that is, of human manipulation, gain, relatively speaking, an increasing importance in comparison with those in charge of the technical aspects of production. The manager, like the worker, like everybody, deals with impersonal giants, with a giant competitive enterprise, with a giant national and world market, with a giant consumer who has to be coaxed and manipulated, with the giant unions and the giant government. All these giants have their own lives, as it were. They determine the activity of the manager and they direct the activity of the worker and clerk. The problem of the manager opens up one of the most significant phenomena in an alienated culture that of bureaucratization. Both big business and government administrations are conducted by a bureaucracy. Bureaucrats are specialists in the administration of things and of men. Due to the bigness of the apparatus to be administered and the resulting abstractification, the bureaucrats' relationship to the people is one of complete alienation. They, the people to be administered, are objects whom the bureaucrats consider neither with love or nor nor with hate, but completely impersonally. The manager bureaucrat must not feel, as far as his professional activity is concerned, he must manipulate people as though they were figures or things. Since the vastness of the organization and the extreme division of labor prevents any single individual from seeing the whole, seeing there is no organic, spontaneous cooperation between the various individuals or groups within the industry, the managing bureaucrats are necessary. Without them, the enterprise would collapse in a short time, since nobody would know the secret which makes it function. Bureaucrats are as indispensable as the tons of paper consumed under their leadership. Just because everybody senses, with a feeling of powerlessness, the vital role of the bureaucrats, they are given an almost godlike respect. If it were not for the bureaucrats, people feel everything would go to pieces and we would starve. Whereas in the medieval world, the leaders were considered representatives of a God-intended order. In modern capitalism, the role of the bureaucrat is hardly less sacred, since he is necessary for the survival of the whole. Marx gave a profound definition of the bureaucrat, saying, 
the bureaucrat relates himself to the world as a mere object of his activity. It is interesting to note that the spirit of bureaucracy has entered not only business and government administration, but also trade unions and the great democratic socialist parties in England, Germany, and France. In Russia, too, the bureaucratic managers and their alienated spirit have conquered the country. Russia could perhaps exist without terror, if certain conditions were given, but it could not exist without the system of total bureaucratization, that is, alienation. What is the attitude of the owner of the enterprise, the capitalist? The small businessman seems to be in the same position as his predecessor a hundred years ago. He owns and directs his small enterprise. He is in touch with the whole commercial or industrial activity and in person and in personal contact with his employees and workers. But living in an alienated world in all other economic and social aspects and furthermore being more under the constant pressure of bigger com uh, competitors, he is by no means as free as his grandfather was in the same business. But what matters more and more in contemporary economy is big business, the large corporation. As Drucker puts it very succinctly, in fine, it is the large corporation, the specific form in which big business is organized in a free enterprise economy which has emerged as the representative and determining socio-economic institution, which sets the pattern and determines the behavior, even of the owner of the corner cigar store who never owned a share of stock, and of his errand boy who never set foot in a mill. And thus the character of our society is determined and patterned by the structural organization of big business, the technology of the mass production plant, and the degree to which our social beliefs and promises are realized in and by the large corporations. What then is the attitude of the owner of the big corporation to his property? It is one of almost complete alienation. His ownership consists in a piece of paper representing a certain fluctuating amount of money. He has no responsibility for the enterprise and no concrete relationship to it in any way. This attitude of alienation has been most clearly expressed in Burles and Means' description of the attitude of the stockholder to the enterprise which follows here. 1. The position of ownership has changed from that of an active to that of a passive agent, in place of actual physical properties over which the owner could exercise direction and for which he was responsible. The owner now holds a piece of paper representing a set of rights and expectations with respect to an enterprise. But over the enterprise and over the physical property, the instruments of production in which he, ha he has an interest, the owner has little control. At the same time, he bears no responsibility with respect to the enterprise or its physical property. It has often been said that the owner of a horse is responsible. If the horse lives, he must feed it. If the horse dies, he must bury it. No such responsibility attaches to a share of stock. The owner is practically powerless through his own efforts to affect the underlying property. 2. The spiritual values that formerly went with ownership have been separated from it. Physical property capable of being shaped by its owner could bring to him direct satisfaction apart from the income it yielded in more concrete form. It represented an extension of his own personality. With the corporate revolution, this quality has been lost to the property owner, much as it has been lost to the worker through the Industrial Revolution. 3. The value of, it, the value of an individual's wealth is coming to depend on forces entirely outside himself and his own efforts. Instead, its value is determined, on the one hand, by the actions of the individuals in command of the enterprise individuals over whom the typical owner has no control, and on the other hand by the actions of others in a sensitive and often capricious market. The value is thus subject to the vagaries and manipulations characteristic of the marketplace. It is further subject to the great swings in society's appraisal of its own immediate future as reflected in the general level of values in the organized market. 4. The value of the individual's wealth not only fluctuates constantly, the same may be said of, mo of most wealth, but it is subject to a constant appraisal. The individual can see the change in the appraised value of his estate from moment to moment, a fact which may markedly affect both the expenditure of his income and his enjoyment of that income. 
Five, individual wealth has become extremely liquid through the organized markets. The individual owner can convert it into other forms of wealth at a moment's notice. And provided the market machinery is in working order, he may do so without serious loss due to forced sales. Six, wealth is less and less in a form which can be employed directly by its owner. When wealth is in the form of land, for instance, it is capable of being used by the owner even though the value of land in the market is negligible. The physical quality of such wealth makes possible subjective value to the owner quite apart from any market value it may have. The newer form of wealth is quite incapable of this direct use. Only through sale in the market can the owner obtain its direct use. He is thus tied to the market as never before. 7. Finally, in the corporate system, the owner of industrial wealth is left with a mere symbol of ownership, while the power, the responsibility, and the substance, which have been an integral part of ownership in the past, are being transferred to a separate group in whose hands lies control. Another important aspect of the alienated position of the stockholder is his control over his enterprise. Legally, the stockholders control the enterprise, that is, they elect the management, much as the people in a democracy elect their representatives. Factually, however, they exercise very little control due to the, due to the fact that each individual's share is so exceedingly small that he is not interested in coming to the meetings and participating actively. Burl and Means differentiate among five major types of control. These include 1. Control through almost complete ownership 2. Majority control 3. Control through a legal device without majority ownership 4. Minority control and 5. Management control Among the five types of control, the first two, private ownership or majority ownership, exercise control in only 6%, according to Wealth, of the 200 largest companies around 1930, while the remaining 94% 94 control is exercised either by the management or by a legal device in collaring a small portion, proportion of the ownership or by a minority of the stockholders. How this miracle is accomplished without force, deception, or any violation of the law is most interestingly described in Burroughs and Means' classic, classic work. The process of consumption is as alienated as the process of production. In the first place, we acquire things without money. We are accustomed to this and take it for granted. Or sorry, we acquire things with money. <laughs> we are accustomed to this and take it for granted. But actually, this is a most peculiar way of acquiring things. Money represents labor and effort in an abstract form. Not necessarily my labor and my effort, since I can have acquired it by inheritance by fraud, by luck, or any number of ways. But even if I have acquired it by my effort, forgetting for the moment that my effort might not have brought me the money, were it not for the fact that I employed men, I've acquired it in a specific way, by a specific kind of effort, corresponding to my skills and capacities. While in spending, the money is transformed into an abstract form of labor and can be exchanged against anything else. Provided I am in the possession of money, no effort or interest of mine is necessary to acquire something. If I have the money, I can acquire an exquisite painting, even though I may not have any appreciation for art. I can buy the best phonograph, even though I have no musical taste. I can buy a library, although I use it only for the purpose of ostentation. I can buy an education, even though I have no use for it except as an additional social asset. I can even destroy the painting or the books I bought, and aside from a loss of money, I suffer no damage. Mere possession of money gives me the right to acquire and to do with my acquisition whatever I like. The human way of acquiring would be to make an effort qualitatively commensurate with what I acquire. The acquisition of bread and clothing would depend on no other premise than that of being alive. The acquisition of books and paintings on my effort to understand them and my ability to use them. How this principle could be applied practically is not the point to be discussed here. What matters is that the way we acquire things is separated from the way in which we use them. The alienating function of money in the process of acquisition and consumption has been beautifully described by Marx in the following words. 
money transforms the real human and natural powers into merely abstract ideas, and hence imperfections, and on the other hand it transforms the real imperfections and imaginings, the powers which only exist in the imagination of the individual into real powers. It transforms loyalty into vice, vices into virtue, the slave into the master, the master into the slave, ignorance into reason and reason into ignorance. He who can buy valor is valiant, although he be cowardly. Assume man as man and his relation to the world as a human one, and you can exchange love only for love, confidence for confidence, etc. If you wish to enjoy art, you must be an artistically trained person. If you wish to have influence on other people, you must be a person who has a really stimulating and furthering influence on other people. Every one of your relationships to man and to nature must be a definite expression of your real, individual life corresponding to the object of your will. If you love without calling forth love, that is, if your love as such does not produce love, if by means of an expression of life as a loving person you do not make of yourself a loved person, then your love is impotent, a misfortune. But beyond the method of acquisition, how do we use things once we have acquired them? With regard to many things, there is not even the pretense of use. We acquire them to have them. We are satisfied with useless possession. The expensive dining set or crystal vase, which we never use for fear they might break. The mansion with many unused rooms. The unnecessary cars and servants, like the ugly bric-a-brac of the lower middle class family, are so many examples of pleasure and possession instead of in use. However, this satisfaction in possessing, per se, was more prominent in the 19th century. Today, most of the satisfaction is derived from possession of things to be used, rather than of things to be kept. This does not alter the fact, however, that even in the pleasure of things to be used, the satisfaction of prestige is a paramount factor. The car, the refrigerator, the television set are for real, but also for conspicuous use. They confer status on the owner. How do we use the things we acquire? Let us begin with food, food and drink. We eat a bread which is tasteless and not nourishing because it appeals to our fantasy of wealth and distinction. Being so white and fresh, actually we eat a fantasy and have lost contact with the real things we eat. Our palate, our body, are excluded from an act of consumption which primarily concerns them. We drink labels. With a bottle of Coca-Cola, we drink the picture of the pretty boy and girl who drink it in the advertisement. We drink the slogan of the pause that refreshes. We drink the great American habit. Least of all, do we drink with our palate. All this is even worse when it comes to the consumption of things whose whole reality is mainly the fiction the advertising campaign has created, like the healthy soap or dental paste. I could go on giving examples and infinitum, but it is unnecessary to belabor the point, since everybody can think of as many illustrations as I could give. I only want to stress the principle involved. The act of consumption should be a concrete human act in which our senses, bodily needs, our aesthetic taste, that is to say in which we, as concrete, sensing, feeling, judging human beings, are involved. The act of consumption should be a meaningful, human, productive experience. In our culture, there is little of that. Consuming is essentially the satisfaction of artificially stimulated fantasies, a fantasy performance alienated from our concrete, real selves. There is another aspect of alienation from the things we consume which needs to be mentioned. We are surrounded by things of, of whose nature and origin we know nothing. The telephone, radio, phonograph, and all other complicated machines are almost as mysterious to us as they would be to a man from a primitive culture. We know how to use them, that is, we know which button to turn, but we do not know on what principle they function, except in the vaguest terms of something we once learned at school. And things which do not rest upon difficult scientific principles... I lost my spot. And things which do not rest upon difficult scientific principles are almost equally alien to us. 
We do not know how bread is made, how cloth is woven, how a table is manufactured, how glass is made. We consume as we produce without any concrete relatedness to the objects with which we deal. We live in a world of things and our only connection with them is that we know how to manipulate or to consume them. Our way of consumption necessarily results in the fact that we are never satisfied, since it is not a real concrete person which consumes a real and concrete thing. We thus develop an ever-increasing need for more things, for more consumption. It is true that as, that as long as the living standard of the population is below a dignified level of subsistence, there is a natural need for more consumption. It is also true that there is a legitimate need for more consumption as man develops culturally and has more refined needs for better food, objects of artistic pleasure, books, etc. But our craving for consumption has lost all connection with the real needs of man. Originally, the idea of consuming more and better things was meant to give man a happier, more satisfied life. Consumption was a means to an end, that of happiness, and now has become an aim in itself. The constant increase of needs forces us to an ever-increasing effort. It makes us dependent on these needs and on the people and institutions by whose help we attain them. Each person speculates to create a new need in the other person, in order to force him into a new dependency, to a new form of pleasure, hence to his economic ruin. With a multitude of commodities grows the realm of alien things which enslave man. Man today is fascinated by the possibility of buying more, better, and especially new things. He, he is consumption hungry. The act of buying and consuming has become a compulsive, irrational aim, because it is an end in itself with little relation to the use of or pleasure in the things bought and consumed. To buy the latest gadget, the latest model of anything that is on the market is the dream of everybody, in comparison to which the real pleasure in use is quite secondary. Modern man, if he dared to be articulate about his concept of heaven, would describe a vision which would look which would look like the biggest department store in the world, showing new new things in gadgets, and himself having having plenty of money with which to buy them. Oh, fuck, I lost my spot again. Um, he would wander around open-mouthed in this heaven of gadgets and commodities, provided only that there were ever more and newer things to buy. And perhaps that his neighbors were just a little less privileged than he. Significantly enough, one of the older traits of middle-class society, the attachment to possessions and property, has undergone a profound change. In the older attitude, a certain sense of loving possession existed between man and his property. It grew on him. He was proud of it. He took good care of it, and it was painful when eventually he had to part from it because it could not be used anymore. There is very little left of this sense of property today. One loves the newness of the thing bought and is ready to betray it when something newer has appeared. Expressing the same change in characterological terms, I can refer to what has been stated above with regard to the boarding orientation as dominant in the picture of the 19th century. In the middle of the 20th century, the hoarding orientation has given way to the receptive orientation in which the aim is to receive, to drink in, to have something new all the time, to live with a continuously open mouth, as it were. This receptive orientation is blended with the marketing orientation, while in the 19th century the hoarding was blended with the exploitative orientation. The alienated attitude toward consumption not only exists in our acquisition and consumption of commodities, but it determines far beyond this the employment of leisure time. What are we to expect? If a man works without genuine relatedness to what he is doing, if he buys and consumes commodities in an abstractified and alienated way, how can he make use of his leisure time in an active and meaningful way? He always remains the passive and alienated consumer. 
He consumes ball games, moving pictures, newspapers and magazines, books, lectures, natural scenery, social gatherings, in the same alienated and abstractified way in which he consumes the commodities he has bought. He does not participate actively. He wants to take in all there is to be had and to have as much as possible of pleasure, culture, and whatnot. Actually, he is not free to enjoy his leisure. His leisure time consumption is determined by industry, as are the commodities he buys. His taste is manipulated. He wants to see and to hear what he is conditioned to want to see and to hear. Entertainment is an industry like any other. The customer is made to buy fun as he is made to buy dresses and shoes. The value of the fun is determined by its success on the market, not by anything which could be measured in human terms. In any productive and spontaneous activity, something happens within himself or within myself. While I am reading, looking at scenery, talking to friends, etc., I am not the same after the experience as I was before. In the alienated form of pleasure, nothing happens within me. I have consumed this or that, nothing has changed within myself, and all that is left are memories of what I have done. One of the most striking examples for this kind of pleasure consumption is the taking of snapshots, which has become one of the most significant leisure activities. The Kodak slogan, you press the button, we do the rest, which since 1889 has helped so much to popularize photography all over the world, is symbolic. It is one of the earliest appeals to push button power feeling. You do nothing. You do not have to do any or have to know anything. Everything is done for you. All you have to do is to press the button. Indeed, the talking of sna- or the taking of snapshots has become one of the most significant expressions of alienated visual perception, of sheer consumption. The tourist with his camera is an outstanding symbol of an alienated relationship to the world. Being constantly occupied with taking pictures, actually he does not see anything at all, except through the intermediary of the camera. The camera sees for him, and the outcome of his pleasure trip is a collection of snapshots, which are the substitute for an experience which he could have had, but did not have. Man is not only alienated from the work he does, and the things and pleasures he consumes, but also from the social forces which determine our society and the life of everybody living in it. Our actual helplessness before the forces which govern us appears more drastically in those social catastrophes, which even though they are denounced as regrettable accidents each time, so far have never failed to happen, economic depressions and wars. These social phenomena appear as if they were natural catastrophes, rather than what they really are, occurrences made by man, but without intention and awareness. This anonymity of the social forces is inherent in the structure of the capitalist mode of production. In contrast to most other societies in which social laws are explicit and fixed on the basis of political power or tradition, capitalism does not have such explicit laws. It is based on the principle that if only everybody strives for himself on the market, the common good will come come of it. Order and not anarchy will be the result. There are, of course, economic laws which govern the market, but these laws operate behind the back of the acting individual who is concerned only with his private interests. You try to guess these laws of the market as a Calvinist in Geneva, tried to guess whether God had predestined him for salvation or not. But the laws of the market, like God's will, are beyond the reach of your will and influence. To a large extent, the development of capitalism has proven that this principle works, and it is indeed a miracle that the antagonistic cooperation of self-contained economic entities should result in a blossoming and ever-expanding society. It is true that the capitalistic mode of production <clears throat> sorry it is true damn it okay to a large extent the development of what 
To a large extent, the development of capitalism has proven that this principle works, and, and indeed it is and it is indeed a miracle that the antagonistic cooperation of self-contained economic entities should result in a blossoming and ever-expanding society. It is true that the capitalistic mode of production is conducive to political freedom, while any centrally planned social order is in danger of leading to political regimentation and eventually to dictatorship. While this is not the place to discuss the question of whether there are other alternatives than the choice between free enterprise and political regimentation, it needs to be said in this context that the very fact that we are governed by laws which we do not control and do not even want to control is one of the most outstanding manifestations of, of alienation. We are the producers of our economic and social arrangements, and at the same time we decline responsibility intention, intentionally and enthusiastically and await hopefully or anxiously, as the case may be, what the future will bring. Our own actions are embodied in the laws which govern us, but these laws are above us, and we are their slaves. The giant state and economic system are not any more controlled by man. They run wild, and their leaders are like a person on a runaway horse, who is proud of managing to keep in the saddle, even though he is powerless to direct the horse. What is modern man's relationship to his fellow man? It is one between two abstractions, two living machines who use each other. The employer uses the one whom he employs. The salesman uses his customers. Everybody is to everybody else a commodity, always to be treated with certain friendliness, because even if he is not of use now, he may be later. There is not much love or hate to be found in human relations of our day. There is rather a, super, a superficial friendliness and a more than superficial fairness, but behind that surface is distance and indifference. There is also a good deal of subtle distrust. When one man says to another, you speak to John Smith, he is all right. It is an expression of reassurance against a general distrust. Even love and the relationship between sexes have assumed this character. The great sexual emancipation as it occurred after the First World War was a desperate attempt to substitute mutual sexual pleasure for a deeper feeling of love. When this turned out to be a disappointment, the erotic polarity between the sexes was reduced to a minimum and replaced by a friendly partnership, a small combine which has amalgamated its forces to hold out better in the daily battle of life and to relieve the feeling of isolation and aloneness which everybody has. The alienation between man and man results in the loss of those general and social bonds which characterize medieval as well as most other pre-capitalist societies. Modern society consists of atoms. If we use the Greek equivalent of individual, little particles estranged from each other, but held together by selfish interests and by the necessity to make use of each other, yet man is a social being with a deep need to share, to help to feel as a member of a group. What has happened to these social strivings in man? They manifest themselves in the special sphere of the public realm, which is strictly separated from the private realm. Our private dealings with our fellow men are governed by the principle of egotism, each for himself, God for us all, in flagrant contradiction to Christian teaching. The individual is motivated by egotistical interest and not by solidarity with and love for his fellow man. The latter feelings may assert themselves secondarily as private acts of philanthropy or kindness, but they are not part of the basic structure of our social relations. Separated from our private life as individuals is the realm of our social life as citizens. In this realm, the state is the embodiment of our social existence. As citizens, we are supposed to, and in fact usually do, exhibit a sense of social obligation and duty. We pay taxes, we vote, we respect the laws, and in the case of war, we are willing to sacrifice our lives. What clearer example could there be of the separation between private and public existence than the fact that the same man who would not think of spending $100 to relieve the need of a stranger does not hesitate to risk his life to save this same stranger when in war they both happen to be soldiers in uniform. The uniform is the embodiment of our social nature, civilian garb, of our egotistic nature. 
An interesting illustration of this thesis is to be found in S. A. Stufer's newest work, an answer to a question directed to a cross section of the American public: What kinds of things do you worry about most? The the vast majority answers by mentioning personal, economic, health, or other problems. Only eight percent are worried about about world problems, including war, and one percent about the danger of communism or the threat of civil liberties. But on the other hand, almost half of the population of the sample thinks that communism is a serious danger, and that war is likely to occur within two years. These social concerns, however, are not felt to be a personal reality; hence, are no cause for worry, although for a good deal of intolerance. It is also interesting to note that, in spite of the fact that almost the whole population believes in God, there seems to be hardly anyone who is worried about his soul. Salvation, his spiritual development, God is as alienated as the world as a whole. What causes concern and worry is the private, separate sector of life, not the social, universal one which connects us with our fellow men. The division between the community and the political state has led to the projection of all social feelings into the state, which thus becomes an idol, a power standing over and above man. Man submits to the state as to the embodiment of his own social feelings, which he worships as powers alienated from himself. In his private life, as an individual, he suffers from the isolation and aloneness, which are the necessary result of this separation. The worship of the state can only disappear if man takes back the social powers into himself, and builds a community in which his social feelings are not something added to his private existence. But in which his private and social existence are one and the same. What is the relationship of man toward himself? I have described elsewhere this relationship as marketing orientation. In this orientation, man experiences himself as a thing to be employed <clears throat> successfully on the market. He does not experience himself as an active agent, as the bearer of human powers. He is alienated from these powers. His aim is to sell himself successfully on the market. His sense of self does not stem from his activity as a loving and thinking individual, but from his socio-economic role. If things could speak, a typewriter would answer the question "Who are you?" by saying "I am a typewriter," and an automobile by saying "I am an automobile," or more specifically by saying "I am a Ford," or a, Bu- a Buick. Or a Cadillac. If you ask a man who are you, he answers, "I am a manufacturer. I am a clerk. I am a doctor. Or I am a married man. I am the father of two kids." And his answer has pretty much the same meaning as that of the speaking thing would have. That is the way he experiences himself, not as a man with love, fear, convictions, doubts, but as that abstraction, alienated from his real nature. Which fulfills a certain function in the social system. His sense of value depends on his success, on whether he can sell himself favorably, whether he can make more of himself than he started out with, whether he is a success. His body, his mind, and his soul are his capital, and his task in life is to invest it favorably, to make a profit of himself. Human qualities like friendliness, courtesy, kindness. Are transformed into commodities, into assets of the personality package, conducive to a higher price in the personality market. If the individual fails in a profitable investment of himself, he feels that he is a failure. If he succeeds, he is a su- he is a success. Clearly, his sense of his own value always depends on factors extraneous to himself. On the fickle judgment of the market, which decides about his value as it decides about the value of commodities, he, like all commodities that cannot be sold profitably on the market, is worthless as far as his exchange value is concerned, even though his use value may be considerable. The alienated personality who is for sale must lose a good deal of the sense of dignity, which is so characteristic of man, even in most. Primitive cultures. He must lose. He must lose almost all sense of self, 
of himself as a unique and induplicable entity. The sense of self stems from the experience of myself as, as the subject of my experiences, my thought, my feeling, my decision, my judgment, my action. It presupposes that my experience is my own and not an alienated one. Things have no self and men who have become things can have no self. This selflessness of modern man has appeared to one of the most gifted and original contemporary psychiatrists, the late H. S. Sullivan, as being a natural phenomenon. He spoke of those psychologists who, like myself, assume that the lack of the sense of self is a pathological phenomenon, as of people who suffer from a delusion. The, the self, for him, is nothing but the many roles we play in relations to others. Roles which have the function of eliciting approval and avoiding the anxiety, which is produced by disapproval. What a remarkably fast deterioration of the concept of self since the 19th century, when Ibsen made the loss of self the main theme of his criticism of modern man in his Pure Gint. Pure Gint? I could be mispronouncing that, but whatever. Pure Gint is described as a man who, chasing after material gain, discovers eventually that he has lost his self, that he is like an onion with layer after layer and without a kernel. Ibsen describes the dread of nothingness by which Pure Gint is seized when he makes this discovery, a panic which makes him desire to land in hell, rather than to be thrown back into the casting ladle of nothingness. Indeed, with the experience of self disappears the experience of identity, and when this happens, man could become insane if he did not save himself by acquiring a second sense of self. He does that by experiencing himself as being approved of, worthwhile, successful, useful, briefly as a saleable commodity which, which is he because he is looked upon by others as an entity, not unique but fitting into one of the current patterns. One cannot fully appreciate the nature of alienation without considering one specific aspect of modern life, its routinization and the repression of the awareness of the basic problems of human existence. We touch here upon a universal problem of life. Man has to earn his daily bread, and this is always a more or less absorbing task. He has to take care of the many time and energy consuming tasks of daily life and he is enmeshed in a certain routine necessary for the fulfillment of these tasks. He builds a social order, conventions, habits, and ideas, which help him to perform what is necessary, and to live with his fellow man with a minimum of friction. It is characteristic of all culture that it builds a man-made artificial world, superimposed on the natural world in which man lives. But man can fulfill himself only if he remains in touch with the fundamental facts of his existence, if he can experience the exaltation of love and solidarity, as well as the tragic fact of his aloneness, and of the fragmentary character of his existence. If he is completely enmeshed in the routine and in the artifacts of life, if he cannot see anything but the man-made, common-sense appearance of the world, he loses his touch with and the grasp of himself in the world. We find in every culture the conflict between routine and the attempt to get back to the fundamental realities of existence. <clears throat> to help in this attempt has been one of the functions of art and of religion, even though religion itself has eventually become a new form of routine. Has become. <clears throat> I think religion is heavily based in routine, isn't it? Anyway, even the most primitive history of man shows us an attempt to get in touch with the essence of reality by artistic creation. Primitive man is not satisfied with the practical function, function of his tools and weapons, but strives to adorn and beautify them, transcending their utilitarian function. Aside from art, the most significant way of breaking through the surface of routine and of getting in touch with the ultimate realities of life is to be found in what may be called by the general term of ritual. I am... I am... 
referring here to ritual in the broad sense of the word as we find it in the performance of a Greek drama, for instance, and not only to rituals in the narrower religious sense. What was the function of the Greek drama? Fundamental problems of human existence were presented in an artistic and dramatic form, and participating in the dramatic performance, the spectator, though not as a spectator in our modern sense of the consumer, was carried away from the sphere of daily routine and brought in touch with himself as a human being, with the roots of his existence. He touched the ground with his feet, and in this process gained strength by which he was brought back to himself. Whether we think of the Greek, Greek drama, the medieval passion play, or an Indian dance, whether we think of Hindu, Jewish, or Christian religious rituals, we are dealing with various forms of dramatization of the fundamental problems of human existence, with an acting out of the very same problems which are thought out in philosophy and theology. What is left of such dramatization of life in modern culture? Almost nothing. Man hardly ever gets out of the realm of man-made conventions and things, and hardly ever breaks through the surface of his routine. Aside from grotesque attempts to satisfy the need for a ritual, as we see it practiced in lodges and fraternities, the only phenomenon approaching the meaning of a ritual is the participation of the, of the spectator in competitive sports. Here, at least, one fundamental problem of human existence is dealt with. The fight between men and the vicarious experience of victory and defeat. But what a primitive and restricted aspect of human existence, reducing the richness of human life to one partial aspect. If there is a fire or a car collision in a big city, scores of people will gather and watch. Millions of people are fascinated daily by reportings of crimes and by detective stories. They religiously go to movies in which crime and passion are their two central themes. All this interest and fascination is not simply an expression of bad taste and sensationalism, but of a deep longing for a dramatization of ultimate phenomena of human existence, life and death, crime and punishment, the battle between man and nature. But while Greek drama dealt with these problems, on a high artistic and metaphysical level, our modern drama and ritual are crude and do not produce any cathartic effect. All this fascination with competitive sports, crime, and passion shows the need for breaking through the routine surface, but the way of its satisfaction shows the extreme poverty of our solution. The marketing orientation is closely related to the fact that the need to exchange has become a paramount drive in modern man. It is, of course, true that even in a primitive economy based on a rudimentary form of division of labor, men exchange goods with each other within the tribe or among neighboring tribes. The man who produces cloth exchanges it for grain, which his neighbor may have produced, or for sickles or knives made by the blacksmith. With increasing division of labor, there is increasing exchange of goods, but normally the exchange of goods is nothing but a means to an economic end. In capitalistic society, exchanging has become an end in itself. None other than Adam Smith saw the fundamental role of the need to exchange and explained it as a basic drive in man. This division of labor, he says, from which so many advantages are derived, is not originally the effect of any human wisdom, which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion. It is the necessary, though very slow and gradual consequence of a, of a certain propensity in human nature, which has in view no such extensive utility, the propensity to, to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. Whether this propensity be one of those original principles in human nature, of which no further account can be given, or whether, as seems more probable, it be the necessary consequence of the faculties of reason and speech, it belongs not to our present subject to inquire. It is common to all men, and to be found in no other race of animals, which seem to know neither this nor any other species of contracts. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. 
The principle of exchange on an ever-increasing scale on the national and world market is indeed one of the fundamental economic principles on which the capitalistic system rests. But Adam Smith foresaw here that this principle was also to become one of the deepest psychic needs of the modern alienated personality. Exchanging has lost its rational function as a mere means for economic purposes and has become an end in itself extended to the non-economic realms. Quite unwittingly, Adam Smith himself indicates the irrational nature of this need to exchange in his example of the exchange between the two dogs. There could be no possible realistic purpose in this exchange. Either the two bones are alike and then there is no reason to exchange them, or the one is better than the other, and then the dog who has the better one would not voluntarily exchange, exchange it. The example makes sense only if we assume that to exchange is a need in itself, even if it does not serve any practical purpose, and this is indeed what Adam Smith does assume. As I have already mentioned in another context, the love of exchange has replaced the love of possession. One buys a car or a house, intending to sell it at the first opportunity. But more important is the fact that the drive for exchange operates in the realm of interpersonal relations. Love is often nothing but a favorable exchange between two people who get the most of what they can expect, considering their value on the personality market. Each person is a package in which several aspects of his exchange value are blended into one. His personality, by which is meant those qualities which make him a good salesman of himself. His looks, education, income, and chance for success. Each person strives to exchange this package for the best value obtainable. Even the function of going to a party and of social intercourse in general is to a large extent that of exchange. One is eager to meet the slightly higher priced packages in order to make contact and possibly a profitable exchange. One wishes to exchange one's social position, and that is one's own self, for a higher one, and in this process one exchanges one's old set of friends, set of habits and feelings for the new ones, just as one exchanges one's Ford for for a Buick. While Adam Smith believed this need for exchange to be an inherent part of human nature, it is actually a symptom of the abstractification and alienation inherent in the social character of modern man. The whole process of living is, is experienced analogously to the profitable investment of capital. My life and my person being the capital which is invested. If a man buys a cake of soap or a pound of meat, he has the legitimate expectation that the money he pays corresponds to the value of the soap or the meat he buys. He is concerned that the equation, so much soap equals so much money, makes sense in terms of the existing price structure, but this expectation has become extended to all other forms of activity. If a man goes to a concert or to the theater, he asks himself more or less explicitly whether the show was worth the money he paid. While this question makes some marginal sense, fundamentally the question does not make any sense, because two incommensurable things are brought together in the, in the equation. The pleasure of listening to a concert cannot possibly be expressed in terms of money. The concert is not a commodity, nor is the experience of listening to it. The same holds true when a man makes a pleasure trip, goes to a lecture, gives a party, or any of the many activities which involve the expenditure of money. The activity in itself is a productive act of living and, incomm and incommensurable with the amount of money spent for it. The need to measure living acts in terms of something quantifiable appears also in the tendency to ask whether something was worth the time. A young man's evening with a girl, a visit with friends, and the many other actions in which expenditure of money may or may not be involved raise the question of whether the activity was worth the money or the time. In each case, one needs to justify the activity in terms of an equation, which shows that it was a profitable investment of energy. 
Even hygiene and health have to serve for the same purpose. A man taking a walk every morning tends to look on it as a good investment for his health rather than a pleasurable activity which does not need any justification. This attitude found its closest and most drastic expression in Bentham's concept of pleasure and pain. Starting on the assumption that the aim of life was to have pleasure, Bentham suggested a kind of bookkeeping which would show for each action whether the pleasure was greater than the pain. And if the pleasure was greater, the action was worthwhile doing. Thus, the whole of life to him was something analogous to a business in which at any given point, the favorable balance would show that it was profitable. While Bentham's views are not very much in the minds of people anymore, the attitude which they express has become ever more firmly established. A new question has arisen in modern man's mind. The question, namely whether life is worth living, and correspondingly the feeling that one's life is a failure or is a success. This idea is based on the concept of life as an enterprise which should show a profit. The failure is like the bankruptcy of a business in which the losses are greater than the gains. This concept is nonsensical. We may be happy or unhappy, achieve some aims and not achieve others. Yet there is no sensible balance which could show whether life is worth while living. Maybe from the standpoint of a balance, life is never worth while living. It ends necessarily with death. Many of our hopes are disappointed. It involves suffering and effort. From a standpoint of the balance, it would seem to make more sense not to have been born at all, or to die in infancy. On the other hand, who will tell whether one happy moment of love, or the joy of breathing or walking on a bright morning and smelling the fresh air is not worth all the suffering and effort which life implies. Life is a unique gift and challenge, not to be measured in terms of anything else, and no sensible answer can be given to the question whether it is worthwhile living, because the question does not make any sense. This interpretation of life as an enterprise seems to be the basis for a typical modern phenomenon, about which a great deal of speculation exists the increase of suicide in modern Western society. Between 1836 and 1890, suicide increased 140% in Prussia, 1836 and 1890, suicide increased 140% in Prussia, 355% in France. England had 62 cases of suicide per million inhabitants in 1836 to 1845, and 110 between 1906 and 1910. Sweden, 66, as against 150, respectively. How can we explain this increase in suicide? accompanying the increase of prosperity in the 19th century. No doubt that the motives for suicide are highly complex, and that there is not a single motivation which we can assume to be the cause. We find revenge suicide as a pattern in China. We find suicide caused by melancholia all over the world. But neither of these motivations play much of a role in the increase of suicide rates in the 19th century. Durkheim, in his classic work on suicide, assumed that the cause is to be found in a phenomenon which he called anomie. He referred by that term to the destruction of all the, tra the traditional social bonds, to the fact the fact that all truly collective organization has become secondary to the state and that all genuine social life has been annihilated. He believed that the people living in the modern political state are a disorganized dust of individuals. 
Durkham's explanation lies in the direction of assumptions made in this book, and I shall return to discuss them later on. I believe also that the boredom and monotony of life which is engendered by the alienated way of living is an additional factor. The suicide figures for the Scandinavian countries, Switzerland and the United States, together with the figures on alcoholism, seem to support this hypothesis. <clears throat> but there is another reason which has been ignored by Durkheim and other students of suicide. It has to do with the whole balance concept of life as an enterprise which can fail. Many cases of suicide are caused by the feeling that life has been a failure, that it is not worthwhile living anymore. One commits suicide just as a businessman declares his bankruptcy, when losses exceed gains, and when there is no more hope of recuperating the losses. C. Various other aspects. Thus far I have tried to give a general picture of the alienation of modern man from himself and his fellow man in the process of producing, consuming, and leisure activities. I want now to deal with some specific aspects of the contemporary social character which are closely related to the phenomenon of alienation, the treatment of which, however, is facilitated by dealing with them separately rather than as subheadings of alienation. 1. Anonymous Authority Conformity The first such aspect to be dealt with is modern man's attitude toward authority. We have discussed the difference between rational and irrational, furthering and inhibiting authority, and stated that Western society in the 18th and 19th centuries was characterized by the mixture of both kinds of authority. What is common to both rational and irrational authority is that it is overt authority. You know who orders and forbids. The father, the teacher, the boss, the king, the officer, the priest. God, the law, the moral conscience. The demands or prohibitions may be reasonable or not, strict or lenient. I may obey or rebel. I always know that there is an authority, who it is, what it wants, and what results from my compliance or my rebellion. Authority in the middle of the 20th century has changed its character. It is not overt authority but anonymous, invisible, alienated authority. Nobody makes a demand, neither a person, nor an idea, nor a moral law. Yet we all conform as much, or more, than people in an intensely authoritarian society would. Indeed, nobody is an authority except it. What is it? Profit, economic necessities, the market, common sense, public opinion, what one does, thinks, feels. The laws of anonymous authority are as invisible as the laws of the market, and just as unassailable. Who can attack the invisible? Who can rebel against nobody? The disappearance of overt authority is clearly visible in all spheres of life. Parents do not give commands anymore. They most definitely do. They suggest that the child will want to do this. Since they have no principles or convictions themselves, they try to guide the children, do what the law of conformity expects, and often being older and hence less in touch with the latest, they learn from the children what attitude is required. The same holds true in business and in industry. You do not give orders, you suggest... I think he's wrong about a lot, man. You do not command, you coax and manipulate. Even the American army has accepted much of the new form of authority. The army is propagandized as if it were an attractive business enterprise. The soldier should feel like a member of a team, even though the hard fact remains that the that he must be trained to kill and be killed. As long as there was overt authority, there was conflict, and there was rebellion against irrational authority. In the conflict with the commands of one's conscience, in the fight against irrational authority, the personality developed, specifically the sense of self developed. I experience myself as I because I doubt, I protest, I rebel. Even if I submit and sense defeat, I experience myself as I. 
I, the defeated one. But if I am not aware of submitting or rebelling, if I am ruled by an anonymous authority, I lose the sense of self. I become a one, a part of the it. The mechanism through which the anonymous authority operates it's, is conformity. I ought to do what everybody does. Hence, I must conform. Not be different. Not stick out. I must be ready and willing to change according to the changes in the pattern. I must not ask whether I am right or wrong, but whether I am adjusted, whether I am not peculiar, not different. The only thing which is permanent in me is just this readiness for change. Nobody has power over me except the herd of which I am a part, yet to which I am subjected. It is hardly necessary to demonstrate to the reader the degree to which this submission to anonymous authority by conformity has reached. However, I want to give a few illustrations taken from the very interesting and illuminating report on a settlement in Park Forest, Illinois, which seems to justify a formulation which the author puts at the head of one of his chapters. The Future Care of Park Forest This development near Chicago was made to house 30,000 people, partly in clusters of rental garden apartments. Rent for two-bedroom duplex, $92. Holy fuck, imagine that. $92. Oh, fuck. That would be lovely. Partly in ranch-type houses for sale. $11,995. The inhabitants are mostly junior executives with a sprinkling of chemists and engineers with an average income of $6,000 to $7,000 between 25 and 35 years of age, married and with one or two children. Well, I guess that makes the $92 a little less exciting, but... What are the social relations and the adjustment in this packaged community? While people move there mainly out of a simple economic necessity and not because of any yen for a womb image, the author notes that after exposure to such an environment, some people find a warmth and support in it that makes other environments seem unduly cold. It is somewhat unsettling, for example, to hear the way residents of the new suburbs occasionally refer to the outside. The feeling of warmth is more or less the same as the feeling of being accepted. I could afford a better place than the development we are going to, says one of the people, and I must say it isn't the kind of place where you have the boss or a customer to dinner. But you get real acceptance in a community like that. This craving for acceptance is indeed a very characteristic feeling in the alienated person. Why should anyone be so grateful for acceptance unless he doubts that he is acceptable? And why should a young, educated, successful couple have such doubts, if not due to the fact that they cannot accept themselves, because they are not themselves? The only haven for having a sense of identity is conformity. Being acceptable really means not being different from anybody else. Feeling inferior stems from feeling different, and no question is asked whether the difference is for the better or the worse. Adjustment begins early. One parent expresses the concept of anonymous authority quite succinctly. The adjustment to the group does not seem to involve so many problems for them, the children. I have noticed that they seem to get the feeling that nobody is the boss. There is a feeling of complete cooperation. Partly this comes from early exposure to court play. The ideological concept in which this phenomenon is expressed here is that of absence of authority, a positive value in terms of 18th and 19th century freedom. The reality behind this concept of freedom is the presence of, anon of anonymous authority and the absence of individuality. What could be clearer for this concept of conformity than the statement made by one mother? Johnny has not been doing so well at school. The teacher told me he was doing fine in some respects, but that his social adjustment was not as good as it might be. He would pick one or two friends to play with, and sometimes he was happy to remain by himself. Indeed, the alienated person finds it almost impossible to, to remain by himself, because he is seized by the panic of experiencing nothingness. That it should be formulated so frankly is nevertheless surprising, and shows that we have even ceased to be ashamed of our herd-like inclinations. The parents sometimes complain that the school might be a bit too permissive, and that the children lack discipline. But whatever the faults of Park Forest parents may be, harshness and authoritarianism are not among them. 
Indeed not, but why would you need authoritarianism in its overt forms if the anonymous authority of conformism makes your children submit completely to the, to the it, even if they do not submit to their individual parents? The complaint of the parents, however, about lack of discipline is not meant too seriously. For what we have in Park Forest, it is becoming evident, is the apotheosis of pragmatism. It would be an exaggeration, perhaps, to say that the transients have come to deify society and the job of adjusting to it, but certainly they have remarkably little yen to quarrel with society. They are, as one puts it, the practical generation. <clears throat> Another aspect of alienated conformity is the leveling out process of taste and judgment, which the author describes under the heading, The Melting Pot. When I first came here, I was pretty rarefied. A self-satisfied egghead explained to a recent visitor. I remember how shocked I was one day when I told the girls in the court how much I had enjoyed listening to the magic flute the night before. They didn't know what I was talking about. I began to learn that diaper talk is a lot more important to them. I still listen to the magic flute, but now I realize that for most people, other things in life seem as important. Another woman reports that she was discovered reading Plato when one of the girls made a surprise visit. The visitor almost fell over from surprise. Now all of them are sure I'm strange. Actually, the author tells us, the poor woman overestimates the damage. The others do not think her overly odd, for her deviance is accompanied by enough tact, enough observ observance of the little customs that oil court life, so that equilibrium is maintained. What matters is to transform value judgment into matters of opinion, whether it is listening to the magic flute as against diaper talk, or whether it is being a Republican as against being a Democrat. All that matters is that nothing is too serious, that one exchanges views, and that one is ready to accept my opinion or conviction, if there, if there is such a thing as being as good as the other. On the market of opinions, everybody is supposed to have a commodity of the same value, and it is indecent and not fair to doubt it. The word which is used for alienated conformity and sociability is, of course, one which expresses the phenomenon in terms of a very positive value. Indiscriminating sociability and lack of individuality is called being outgoing. The language here becomes psych psychiatrically tinged with the philosophy of Dewey thrown in for good measure. You can really help make a lot of people happy here, says one social activist. I've brought out two couples myself. I saw potentialities in them they didn't realize they had. Whenever we see someone who is shy and withdrawn, we make a special effort with them. Another aspect of social adjustment is the complete lack of privacy and the indiscriminate talking of one's problems. Here again, one sees the influence of modern psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Even the thin walls are greeted as a help from feeling alone. I never feel lonely even when Jim's away, goes the typical comment. You know friends are nearby because at night you hear the neighbors through the walls. Marriages which went which might break up otherwise are saved. Depressed moods are kept from becoming worse by talking, talking, talking. It's wonderful, says one young wife. You find yourself discussing all your problems with your neighbors, things that back in South Dakota, we would have kept to ourselves. As time goes on, this capacity for self-revelation grows. And on the most intimate details of family life, court people become amazingly frank with each other. No one, they point out, ever need face a problem alone. We may add that we'd be more correct to say that, n that never do they face a problem. Even the architecture becomes functional in the battle against lo loneliness, just as doors inside houses, which are sometimes said to have marked the birth of the middle class, are disappear disappearing. 
so are the barriers against neighbors. The picture in the picture window, for example, is what is going on inside, or what is going on inside other people's picture windows. The conformity pattern develops a new morality, a new kind of super ego. But the new morality is not the conscience of the humanistic tradition, nor is the new super ego made in the image of an authoritarian father. Virtue is to be adjusted and to be like the rest. Vice to be different. Often this is expressed in psychiatric terms, where virtuous means being healthy and evil, being neurotic. From the eye of the court, there is no escape. Love affairs are rare for that reason. <coughs> Rather than for moral reasons or the fact that the marriages are so satisfactory, there are feeble, feeble attempts at privacy, while the rule is that you walk into the house without knocking or making any, any other sign. Some people gain a little privacy by moving the chair to the front rather than the court side of the apartment to show that they do not want to be disturbed. <clears throat> But there is an important corollary of such efforts at privacy. People feel a little guilty about making them. Except very occasionally to shut oneself off from others like this is regarded as either a childish prank or more likely an indication of some inner neurosis. The individual, not the group, has erred. So at any rate, many errants seem to feel, and they are often penitent about what, what elsewhere would be regarded as one's own business, and rather normal business at that. I've promised myself to make it up to them. One court resident recently told a confidant, I was feeling bad and just plain didn't, didn't make the effort to ask the others in later. I don't blame them really for reacting the way they did. I'll make it up to them somehow. Indeed, privacy has become clandestine. Again, the terms which, we, which are used are taken from the progressive political and philosophic tradition. What could sound finer than the sentence, not in solitary and selfish contemplation, but in doing things with other people does one fulfill oneself? What it really means, however, is giving up oneself, becoming part and parcel of the herd and liking it, this state is often called by another pleasant word, togetherness. The favorite way of expressing the same state of mind is that of putting it in psychiatric terms. We have learned not to be so introverted, one, jun one junior executive, and a very thoughtful and successful one, describes the lesson. Before we came here, we used to live pretty much to ourselves. On Sundays, for instance, we used to stay in bed until around maybe two o'clock, reading the paper and listening to the symphony, on the radio. Now we stop around and visit with people, or they visit with us. I really think Park Forest has broaden, broadened us. Lack of conformity is not only punished by disapproving words like neurotic, but sometimes by cruel sanctions. Estelle is a case, says one resident of a highly active block. She was dying to get in with the gang when she moved in. She is a very warm-hearted gal and is always trying to help people but she's well sort of elaborate about it. One day she decided to win over everybody by giving an afternoon party for the gals. Poor thing, she did it all wrong. The girls turned up in their bathing suits and slacks as usual, and here she had little doilies and silver, and everything spread around. Ever since then, it's been almost like a planned campaign to keep her out of things. It's really pitiful. She sits there in her beach chair out front, just dying for someone to come and cafe clutch with her and right across the street four or five of the girls will be yakking away every time they suddenly all laugh at some jokes she thinks they are laughing at her she came over here yesterday and cried all afternoon she told me she and her husband are thinking about moving somewhere else so they can make a fresh start other cultures have punished deviants from the from the prescribed political or religious creed by prison or the stake here the punishment is only ostracism, which drives a poor woman into despair and an intense feeling of guilt. What is the crime? One act of error, one single sin toward the god of conformity. 
It is only another aspect of the alienated kind of interpersonal relationship that friendships are not formed on the basis of individual liking or attraction, but that they are determined by the location of one's own house or apartment in relation to the others. This is the way it works. It begins with the children. The new suburbs are matriarchies, yet the children are in effect so dictatorial that a term like filiarchy would be would not be entirely facetious. It is the children who set the basic design. Their friendships are translated into the mother's friendships, and these in turn to the families. Fathers just tag along. It is the flow of wheeled juvenile traffic that determines which is to be the functional door, i.e. in the homes, the front door, in the courts, the back door. It determines further the route one takes from the functional door for when wives go visiting with neighbors, they gravitate toward the houses within sight and hearing of their children in the telephone. This crystallizes into the court checkerboard movement, i.e. the regular Kefiklach route, and this forms the basis of adult friendships. Actually, this determination of friendship goes so far that the reader of the article is invited by the author to pick out the clusters of friendship in one sector of the settlement, just from the picture of the location of the houses, their entrance and exit doors in this sector. What is important in this picture is not only the fact of alienated friendships and automaton conformity, but the reaction of people to this fact. Consciously, it seems people fully accept the new form of adjustment. Once people hated to concede that their behavior was determined by anything except their own free will, not so with the new suburbanites. They are fully aware of the all-pervading power of the environment over them. As a matter of fact, there are a few subjects they like so much to talk about, and with the increasing lag curiosity about psychology, psychi psychiatry, and sociology, they discuss their social life in surprisingly clinical terms. But they have no sense of plight. This, they seem to say, is the way things are, and the trick is not to fight it, but to understand it. This young generation has also its philosophy to explain their way of life, not merely as an in instinctive wish, but as an articulate set of values to be passed on to one's children. The next generation of leaders are coming to deify social utility. Does it work? Not why has become the key question. With society having become so complex, the individual can have meaning only as he contributes to the harmony of the group, transients explain. And for them, constantly on the move, ever exposed to new groups, the adapting to groups has become particularly necessary. They are all, as they themselves so often put it, in the same boat. On the other hand, the author tells us the value of solitary thought, the fact that co conflict is sometimes necessary, and other such disturbing thoughts rarely intrude. The most important, or really the only important thing children as well as adults have to learn is to get along with other people, which, if taught in school, is called citizenship, the equivalent for outgoingness and togetherness, as the adults call it. Are people really happy? Are they as satisfied unconsciously as they believe themselves to be? Considering the nature of man and the conditions for happiness, this can hardly be so. But they even have some doubts consciously. While they feel that conformity and merging with the group is their duty Many of them sense that they are frustrating other urges. They feel that responding to the group mores is akin to a moral duty, and so they continue, hesitant and unsure, imprisoned in brotherhood. Every once in a while, I wonder, says one transient in an almost furtive moment of contemplation, I don't want to do anything to offend the people here. They're kind and decent, and I'm proud we've been able to get along with each other, with all our differences, so well. But then once in a while, I think of myself and my husband and what we are not doing, and I get depressed. Is it just, an, is it just enough not to be bad? Indeed, this life of compromise, this outgoing life, is the life of imprisonment, selflessness, and depression. They are all in the same boat. But as the author says very pointedly, where is the boat going? No one seems to have the faintest idea. Nor, for that matter, do they see much point in even raising the question. The picture of conformity as we have illustrated it with the outgoing inhabitants of Park Forest is certainly not the same all over America. The reasons are obvious. 
these people are young, they are middle class, and they move upwards. They are mostly people who in their work career manipulate symbols and men, and whose advancement depends on whether they permit themselves to be manipulated. There are undoubtedly many older people of the same occupational group and many equally young people of different occupational groups who are less advanced. As for instance, those engineers, chemists, and physicists more interested in their work than in the hope of jumping into an executive career as soon as possible. Furthermore, there are millions of farmers and farmhands whose style of life has only been changed partly by the conditions of the 20th century. Eventually, the industrial workers whose income is not too different from the white-collar workers, but whose work situation is. Although this is not the place to discuss the meaning of work for the industrial worker today, this much can be said here. There is undoubtedly a difference between people who manipulate other people and people who create things, even though their role in the process of production is a partial and in many ways an alienated one. The worker in a big steel mill cooperates with others, and has to do so if he is to protect his life. He faces dangers and shares them with others. His colleagues as well as the foreman can judge and appreciate his skill rather than his smile and pleasant personality. He has a considerable amount of freedom outside of work. He has paid vacations. He may be busy in his garden with a hobby with local and union politics. However, even taking into account all these factors which differentiate the industrial worker from the white-collar worker and the higher strata of the middle classes, there seems little chance that eventually the industrial worker will escape being molded by the dominant conformity pattern. In the first place, even the most positive aspects of his work situation, like the ones just mentioned, do not alter the fact that his work is alienated, and only to a limited extent a meaningful expression of his energy and reason. Secondly, the... The trend for increasing automization of industrial work dim diminishes this latter factor rapidly. Eventually, he is under the influence of our whole cultural apparatus, the advertisements, movies, television, newspapers, just as everybody else, and can hardly escape being driven into conformity, although perhaps more slowly than other sectors of the population. What holds true for the industrial worker holds true also for the farmer.